Abinadi takes their question, Isaiah 52, and fast forwards just a titch to Isaiah 53. It says, hopefully you've read ahead a little bit because there's no more Christ-centered, grace-filled, condescension-focused chapter in Isaiah than chapter 53. This is one of the famous suffering servant passages. But in the context of what Abinadi is trying to accomplish, it's not just the suffering servant, it's the condescending Christ. If we use the end of chapter 13 as the introduction to Abinadi's use of Isaiah 53, it's to say that God himself will come down to do this. That he'll allow the, ga- the gap to fully be present in our lives and then fill it with condescending grace so he can bring us back up to him. Look, for example, at some of the phrases that he uses from Isaiah that speak of this condescending Christ. Chapter 14, verse 1, Yea, even doth not Isaiah say, Who hath believed our report? It's like, can you even believe this? It's incredible what God is going to do here. To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Now, notice condescension. For he... The Lord, God himself, Jehovah, shall grow up before him, but he'll do it as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. When we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. You want to talk about condescension. The creator of worlds without number creator of beauty itself becomes a part of his own creation without as much beauty as those around him. The living water comes to earth in dry ground. The unbending tree of life condescends to be a mere tender plant. He that can make beauty from ashes comes with no beauty of his own that we should desire him. Verse 3, he's despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised. We esteemed him not. You want to talk about condescension? He grapples with the gap. He who knows this level and maintained it perfectly in pre-mortality is willing to come down to be not only with us, but to be like us so that eventually that can be reversed and we are with God and, more importantly, like God. Verse 4, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He came down to be able to pick them up. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Such beautiful role reversal in verse 5. He versus our. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquities of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. That's what he came for. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Thy will be done, Father. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation, what he's trying to produce through this life of condescension? He was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people was he stricken. He made his grave with the wicked, with the rich in his death. Because he's done no evil, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. That was the plan from the beginning. It pleased the Father to send his Son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. Who's going to declare that generation, even though he was cut off from the land of the living? That was the biggest fear of ancient Israel, not to have posterity, because your name would be cut off from the land of the living. 
Where will that next generation come from? Will you see your seed? Well, in this case, this condescending Christ, when he makes his soul an offering for sin, then he sees his seed. That's what it was all for. Remember King Benjamin's address? We become that way the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters, spiritually begotten of him, changed through faith on his name. That will prolong his days because he'll live on through us. That way the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Because we're prospering. Because we're in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. I love that phrase. It's by his knowledge. Knowledge gained the hard way. Knowledge gained in Gethsemane. Experiential knowledge, not just cognitive knowledge. Over Easter, I did a whole video called The Awful Arithmetic of the Atonement that brings in so much of this and spends some quality time in Mosiah chapter 15. It was Christ's knowledge, perfect empathy, gained by taking upon himself all of our sickness and sin and sorrow and suffering. It's by that knowledge that he can then justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities and everything else. He bore it so that he would have knowledge, so that he might know according to the flesh how to succor his people, as Alma will say a little bit later. Maybe this is where Alma is starting to understand it, enough that he can pass it on to his son, who will then teach it to others. Verse 12, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. Having condescended, now you can have a portion with the great, The line has not budged, but you have condescended and helped bring people back. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sins of many. He made intercession for the transgressors. That's what Jesus did. That is what the ceremonial law points to. Every type and shadow. That is what the moral law forces us to grapple with, our own inability to live up to it, notwithstanding the law of Moses. Every commandment, every consequence, every symbol, every sacrifice, pointing to Jesus Christ. And now Abinadi picks up where Isaiah left off. These next few verses in in Mosiah chapter 15 are some of the trickiest verses in all of Scripture to understand, in my opinion. I remember as a missionary, meeting a woman who was an evangelical Christian who used to be a member of the Community of Christ, the former reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. She knew the Book of Mormon better than any investigator I'd ever met because she was raised with it. But she had left that branch of Mormonism to become an evangelical Trinitarian Christian. And part of the reason she said to me, was because of Abinadi's words in Mosiah chapter 15. I was like, what? I've never had anybody throw Mosiah 15 in my face. I never had anybody quote Abinadi to try to push back against the restored gospel. She said, you don't believe your own book. Abinadi was a Trinitarian. I'm like, huh? And she read to me the first three verses of Mosiah 15. She said, And I said unto them, I would that ye should understand that God himself shall come down among the children of men and shall redeem his people. And because he dwelleth in flesh, he shall be called the Son of God. And having subjected the flesh to the will of the Father, being the Father and the Son, see, he's both, the Father because he was conceived by the power of God and the Son because of the flesh, thus becoming the Father and the Son, and they are one God, yea, the very eternal Father of heaven and earth. And kind of crossed her arms and said, see, Abinadi was a Trinitarian. And I was dumbfounded as a 19-year-old. I'm thinking, yeah, he does sound kind of like a closet Trinitarian. Uh, I I don't know what we do with this. I wish I had understood better at the time, but I understand it much better now. Because of the context of this passage, He is not trying to explain the nature of God. Has he done any of that yet? That's not the point of this discourse. He's trying to understand the nature of the atonement. 
trying to explain that to a group of priests that just don't get it at all. In technical terms, there's a word called Christology, kind of the science of Jesus. How, would, how, how, is he God? Is he man? What is this? And there's another one called Soteriology, which is the science of the atonement, the study of redemption. How does atonement work? And then there's Trinitarianism, that whole branch of theology. What this woman was accusing Abinadi of doing was teaching Trinitarianism, when in context, he was teaching Christology and teaching soteriology, most importantly. What did he just do? He just quoted Isaiah 53, atonement central. What's he been trying to help them see? What saves you? Is it the law of Moses? Is it this? Is it this? Is it filling it in with nothing, with ceremony? Is it this? How are we saved? Soteriology. How does Christ do it? Christology. This is not Trinitarianism. So how are we to make sense of this passage? Let me try to explain. As you read the first eight or nine verses of Mosiah 15, don't think of Heavenly Father at all. Think of Jesus Christ, but think of both sides of Jesus. Jesus had a dual inheritance because of his birth. He's the only begotten Son of God in the flesh, but he's also the Son of Mary according to the flesh. So he has a divine father and a mortal mother. Now with any birth, there are family resemblances. There is an inheritance of traits. And so from his father, Jesus would have inherited immortality, power over life. From his mother, he would have inherited mortality, power to die. Now death doesn't seem like much of a gift, but if you have to atone for the sins of the world, you have to be able to suffer and be able to overcome that suffering. If you have to die for all men, you have to be able to die and then be able to take that life up again. There was no other way than Jesus because he was the only that had that dual nature, fully God and fully man. Now this is not Trinitarianism. This is the nature of Christ. Now we could have labeled those two sides in any number of ways. And the two sides are essential. It's the two sides that allow him to atone. Abinadi is teaching atonement. Now he's trying to explain how Jesus makes it possible or how it was possible for Jesus to accomplish it. So let's talk about Jesus' dual nature, this divine side and this mortal side. He could have labeled it like that, the divine, the mortal. He could have called it his father side and his mother side. He could have called it his Elohim side and his Mary side. Instead, what Abinadi uses is his father side and his son side. So it's not when he says father and son, he's not talking, oops, switch, let's talk about heavenly father. It's no, he's still talking about Jesus, but let's talk about the father side of Jesus. I am both a father and a son. There are times I feel like the father and have to make the hard decisions and have my big boy pants on. There are other times where I feel like the son and wish my dad were still around to do all those things himself when I have to do them instead. And in Jesus' ministry, there are places, if you look at the New Testament closely, you can tell which side of Jesus is talking. The, the one we're most familiar with is that threefold prayer in Gethsemane. Let this cup pass. That's the sun side talking. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. That's the father side talking. Okay? Look at both sides whenever they're mentioned here. And you'll understand how Jesus was able to, how God himself, remember the end of verse of chapter 13, how God himself will come down among the children of men to redeem us. The divine side held that line and the, the, the mortal side, the son side came down to fill the gap with himself to know the extremes, to answer the ends of the law and to descend below all things. So look for both sides in chapter 15. Now Abin and I said unto them, I would that ye should understand that God himself, this is God the Son, God Jesus, Jehovah, shall come down, that's condescension, among the children of men and shall redeem his people. Here's how. Because he dwelleth in flesh, he shall be called the Son. Because he had a mortal mother, physical body, he shall be called the Son of God. And having subjected the flesh side of him, to the will of the father side of him, being the father and the son, he's not just giving in to his dad. He's 
honoring the divine within him. You and I get this. We do it every fast Sunday. The mortal side of us, the son, daughter side of us wants to eat, wants to sneak Snickers in the pantry with nobody watching. But it's the divine side of us. The, the flesh is weak, right? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We all have those two sides. The father side, mother side is the one that says, no, body, you don't get your way today. I'm in charge. And that's what's happening here. Having subjected the flesh side, that son side, to the will of the father side, being the father side and the son side all rolled into one, that's Jesus. The father side, because he was conceived by the power of God. That's the father side, the father line on the family tree. And the son side, because of the flesh. There's the Mary side of the family tree. Thus becoming the father side and son side all at once. Verse 4, they, he, take either pronoun, they work. It's still one God. It's still just Jesus. This isn't Trinitarianism. I haven't brought in the Heavenly Father or the Holy Ghost to this discussion at all. This is Jesus. He's the very eternal Father of heaven and earth. He created it. This is God the second. Verse 5, and thus the flesh side of Jesus, becoming subject to the spirit side of Jesus. Then he clarifies it himself. Or the son side to the father side. Being one God. I'm just talking about Jesus. That's it. Suffereth temptation. There's the son side. And yieldeth not to the temptation. There's the father side. But suffereth himself to be mocked and scourged and cast out and disowned by his people. There's the son side. After all this, after working many mighty miracles among the children of men, there's the father side, he shall be led, yea, even as Isaiah said, as a sheep before her the shear is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Yea, even so he shall be led, crucified and slain. The flesh side of Jesus becoming subject even unto death. The will of the son side being swallowed up in the will of the father side. And thus God, here's the father side, breaketh the bands of death, having gained the victory over death. And then notice this switch back to the other side, giving the son side power to make intercession for the children of men. That's my favorite switch. It may have been the divine side that could stare death in the face and overcome it, but it's the son side that stares us in the face and says, I get it. I understand how weak you are. I have mercy. My bowels are filled with compassion according to the flesh because I took upon myself your weakness, your infirmities, your griefs, your sorrows, not just your sins. I took the whole thing. I get it. And because of that, I am willing to fill the whole gap with my grace. Not just my mercy to buy you time, but also my enabling power to help get you around those infirmities and weaknesses to turn you into someone like me. I am able to make you holy, as he says in the Doctrine and Covenants. Verse 9, having ascended into heaven, there's a father side, having the bowels of mercy being filled with compassion towards the children of men. There's the son's side. Standing betwixt them and justice, having broken the bands of death, taken upon himself their iniquity and their transgressions, having redeemed them and satisfied the demands of justice. That's soteriology based on Christology. That is Easter growing out of Christmas. That is atonement as a result of incarnation and condescension. That's how you fill the gap. It's the only way that really works. So repent. You can and you must. Verse 10, Abinadi further explains some of the trickier passages from Isaiah 53. I say unto you, who shall declare his generation? Behold, I say unto you that when his soul has been made an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. So he's just quoting Isaiah again. And so he answers the question in verse 11. Who is Christ's seed? King Benjamin already told us, right? But here's Abinadi's turn. Verse 11. Whosoever has heard the words of the prophets 
Yea, all the holy prophets who have prophesied concerning the coming of the Lord. He said that back in chapter 13, right? They've all pointed to this. I say unto you, all those who have hearkened unto their words and believed the Lord would redeem his people and have looked forward to that day for a remission of their sins, those are his seed. They are the heirs of the kingdom of God. You understand now what Abinadi is doing to declare Christ's generation? What Jesus is doing in terms of seeing his seed from his divine vantage point on the cross? The results of his salvation the creation of his condescension, his posterity, having laid hold of the promises of God. Verse 12, For these are they whose sins he has borne. These are they for whom he has died, to redeem them from their transgressions. And now are they not his seed? 13, Are not the prophets, everyone that opened his mouth to prophesy, like he's doing? All that haven't fallen into transgression, like they've done. All the holy prophets ever since the world began, that's his seed. And now let me answer your question. I'm sorry it's taken me two chapters to get here. But verse 14, they are they who have published peace, real peace, who have brought good tidings of good, not good tidings somehow morphed out of bad, not fake cheer, but true joy, who have published salvation not rationalization, who have said to Zion, thy God reigneth, not some natural man, do as you will, king. And oh, how beautiful upon the mountains were their feet. Those are the feet we're looking for. Not some pedicured principle of cheap grace and easy salvation of do whatever you want and it's all covered through some ceremonial observance. Those are not the beautiful feet he's talking about. These are blistered feet, dirt under the toenail, not in some over-anxious attempt to claw our way to salvation, but rather to humbly kneel, to diligently serve feet that have been fouled and dirtied by a life in a wicked and fallen world, but have been washed clean by a condescending Christ who washes the feet of every disciple who is willing. Those feet are beautiful. Verse 16, again, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of those that are still publishing peace. And again, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of those who shall hereafter publish peace. Yea, from this time henceforth and forever. Did you catch the verb tenses changing in each one of those verses? Past tense in 15, present tense in 16, future tense in 17, all to crescendo up in verse 18 to how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that is the founder of peace, yea, even the Lord who has redeemed his people, yea, him who has granted salvation unto his people. Those are the most beautiful feet of all. Scars notwithstanding. You see how Abinadi has brought it all full circle to be able to answer the question? You want to publish peace? Then follow the Prince of Peace. And true prophets true messengers, criers of repentance, those who introduce mercy but at no expense to justice, people that grapple with the gap but show the true way to bridge it, those feet, past, present, future, combining with the feet of the Prince of Peace himself. Now that is beauty upon the mountain of the Lord. Verse 19, Were it not for the redemption which he hath made for his people, which was prepared from the foundation of the world. That was the plan from the very beginning, from before the beginning. Were it not for this, all mankind must have perished. As he said earlier, notwithstanding the law, moral, ceremonial, or anything else. That's how it happens. Verse 20, The bands of death shall be broken. The sun reigneth and hath power over the dead. 
He bringeth to pass the resurrection of the dead. There cometh a resurrection, even a first resurrection, a resurrection of those that have been and who are and who shall be, even until the resurrection of Christ, for so shall he be called. The resurrection of all the prophets, all those that have believed in their words, or all those that have kept the commandments of God, they come forth in the first resurrection. They are the first resurrection. They are raised to dwell with God who redeemed them. They have eternal life through Christ who has broken the bands of death. These are those who have part in the first resurrection. These are they that have died before Christ came in their ignorance, not having salvation declared unto them. And thus the Lord bringeth about the restoration of these. And they have a part in the first resurrection. Eternal life, redeemed by the Lord. Little children too. But for you, those that would not keep the commandments, those that have willfully rebelled against God, there's no first resurrection for that. Verse 27, because the Lord cannot redeem such. He can't deny himself. He can't deny justice when it has its claim. He will not let that top line budge. Nor does he need to, having condescended to bring everyone up to it. Now, eventually, everybody's going to know. Verse 28, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people is going to hear that. Because 29, God's watchmen will lift up their voice, hard sayings and all. With their voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. You see Abinadi's finishing the Isaiah text that they set him up with earlier. Break forth unto joy, into joy. Sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. The Lord hath comforted his people. He's comforted them in the right way, the only true lasting way that comfort can come, through the redemption of Christ, not through some non-redemptive avoidance of the consequences of sin. That's Satan's plan. That's the message of the priests of Noah. That's modern, you do you, come as you are, leave as you were, cheap grace, easy salvation, not the kind that the Lord wants us to receive. Now, I suppose that Abinadi could have ended right there. Instead, chapter 16, it's as if he reviews the whole tile lesson that Arturo and I had together. Notice the elements. 16.1, after Abinadi had spoken these words, he stretched forth his hand and said, The time shall come when all shall see the salvation of the Lord, and everyone will see eye to eye and confess that God's judgments are just. It's almost like he's saying, the world will acknowledge that that top line, the grout line, will not budge. Our beliefs and behaviors must come into line with God's command. Verse 2, Then shall the wicked be cast out, and shall cause to howl and weep and wail and gnash their teeth, because they would not hearken unto the voice of the Lord. The gap isn't going anywhere either. If we don't do it in the right way, there will be consequences. Verse 3, they were carnal and, and devilish. The devil had power over them. Verse 4, all mankind were lost and would have been endlessly lost were it not that God redeemed his people from their lost and fallen state. There's Christ's willingness to come down to the bottom grout line and grow up in God right alongside us to bring us home. Unless we, verse 5, persist in our own carnal nature. If we put up the dukes, push back against him, don't accept his redeeming grace. Maintain the natural man instead of put him off. If we go on in the ways of sin and rebellion, if we remain in our fallen state when the Lord is trying to change us to make us his, then it's as if there were no redemption made. And then in verse 6, Abinadi slips a little bit with his grammar. I'm so glad that he does. He says, if Christ had not come into the world, and then it's almost like he checked the bottom of the page where it suggests the dates, and he's like, ooh, still B.C., <laughs> Sorry about my past tense verbiage. I said if Christ had not come into the world. Well, I guess technically he hasn't yet. And then he corrects himself. I mean, it's hard to erase on plates, right? So he adds this phrase in verse 6. Speaking of things to come as though they had already come. I love that. To have enough faith that you can speak of the future in the past tense. You know, if Jesus hadn't come, I know he hasn't, but he will. And so technically he has in my mind. Can you imagine having enough faith to speak out everything like that? Don't you remember the second coming? Wasn't it awesome? And people are like, wait, wait, did I miss something? 
Oh, no, no, no. Technically, no, you haven't missed it yet. You might. Uh, but we're living in such a way that it feels like the millennium's already begun. So might as well talk in the past tense. That's what Abinadi is doing. Without Jesus, there could have been no redemption. There's, that's the only way. There's no jack-in-the-box approach to this. Eventually, the crank will turn and the latch will move and the lid will open and the jack-in-the-box will pop and the full gap will be there before our face. And if we haven't accepted Jesus and lived within his grace, then there's no redemption. Verse 7, if Christ had not risen from the dead or broken the bonds, the bands of death, and the grave should have no victory and that death should have no sting, without all that, there could be no resurrection. But there is a resurrection. And because of that, now, as you read the next few verses, think about what's about to happen to Abinadi in chapter 17, when he pays for his testimony with his life. I sometimes wonder, yes, Alma must have been hearing these words and internalizing them, but I think one of Abinadi's most important audience members for this particular part of the discourse was himself, probably knowing what was coming. So to hear himself, almost in echo one chapter later as the flames ascended, but there is a resurrection The grave hath no victory. The sting of death is swallowed up in Christ. He is the light and the life of the world. So bring on your darkness and your death. I don't fear it. Yea, a light that is endless, that can never be darkened. Yea, a life which is endless, that there can be no more death. This mortal shall put on immortality, His soon enough would. This corruption shall put on incorruption. It will be brought to stand before the bar of God. He was about to stand before it himself, to be judged of him according to their works, whether they be good or whether they be evil. Now, Bennett, I would have known that his, like all of ours, is a combination of the two. But to repent of the second and fully live into the first. There is a resurrection of endless life. There is a resurrection of endless damnation. We're choosing which we'll receive. Verse 12, those that have gone according to their own carnal wills and desires, bringing, forgetting instead of repenting, bringing beliefs down instead of behaviors up. Have you never called upon the Lord while the arms of mercy were extended towards them? For the arms of mercy were extended towards them, and they would not. They were warned of their iniquities. Isn't that what he'd been doing? But they would not rep- depart from them. They were commanded to repent. They would not repent. Three times in that verse, they would not. Isn't that what Jesus said through his tears at the end of Matthew 23? How oft would I have gathered you as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, but ye would not? Abinadi is echoing the voice of that mother hen, that good shepherd. So in verse 13, ought ye not to tremble and repent of your sins? Can't you remember that only in and through Christ can you be saved? Back to you, priests. If you want to teach the law of Moses, fine. But do it right. Teach the deadness of the law so they know their life is in Christ. Teach the inadequacy of both the moral and the ceremonial law. Teach that the one is meant to point forward to Jesus and the other is to force us to recognize our need for him. Teach that it's a shadow of those things which are to come. Teach them that redemption cometh through Christ the Lord, who is the very eternal Father. Quit stuffing the -the jack-in-the-box down. Let people feel the weight of their sin and then feel the reach of those arms of mercy lifting us into the redemption of Christ the Lord. Unfortunately, that blindness of mind and hardness of heart that we saw earlier doesn't allow King Noah to change at all. He pronounces the death penalty in chapter 17, verse 1. But there is one whose eyes became a little less dim because of this light of the world that was preached to him, whose heart became a little softer, knowing that there still was a way to obtain peace in the right way. This was a young man, a descendant of Nephi, whose name was Alma. 
he knew concerning the iniquity which Abinadi had testified against them. That's interesting. He still had enough of a conscience to realize we are doing something wrong. No matter how many, no matter how many times that my fellow priests are smoothing it over, saying it's all covered, it's all fine, it's not a problem. There's no law, so there's no sin, so there's no guilt. Well, darn it, there is still guilt. Secularists often want to say that all of religion is merely the social construction of reality. It's mere human psychology. That the Holy Ghost is just self-induced. And that guilt is just socially constructed. I'll admit, so much of our realities are based on the society that gave us eyes to see. But my culture did not give me my conscience. God did that. And so for a young Alma, whose socially constructed reality was one of no sin at all, realizes what he's always known, that iniquity is real. And there has to be a way to overcome it. I had a conversation once with a returning less active. Less active is a nice way to put it. He had been, he'd gone so far away from church that he'd become an atheist. But at one point he came and said, can we talk? And I said, of course. And we sat down together before an institute class once. And he said, you know, I used to be an atheist. And I perked up and said, used to? There's a story here, isn't there? I'd love to hear it. And he shared some of his experiences going towards atheism and then the incredible miracles that turned him back. He said, I know God is real. I'm just still not sure about the church. And I said, good, don't get ahead of yourself though. Knowing God is the first layer, the deepest bedrock layer of your foundation. So many people are tinkering with their testimonies of the church when there are cracks that go all the way down to the rock. You need to be building firmly from ground up. So start with God. You're in a beautiful place. We'll get to the church eventually, but I'm glad you have a testimony of God. I was about to say, now you need the testimony of Jesus. But something held me back, and I felt like, no, that's still too quick. I said, well, what's, what's, what comes between God and Jesus? And I felt the answer, sin does. Oh. So the first question is, is there a God? But the second question is, is there such a thing as sin? Because there could be a God that doesn't care about sin. It could be like a heavenly grandfather instead of a heavenly father. You know, the kind that just spoils your rotten and wants everybody to have a good time and just kind of pats, yourself, pats you on the head and gives you a Werther's original. I mean, it, that could be God. But if God cares how we live, if he has a line, a grout line that won't move, then there is such a thing as sin. And if there's sin, there has to be a solution for it. And that's where Christianity comes in. Is Christianity God's solution to sin? And once you know that, then the church comes in. And is the church the vehicle Christ has created to bring you to his atoning grace so that then he can get you through sin and back to the Father? Well, Alma knows their sin. and he's, I, Perhaps he's always wondered, does that way really work? Does the stuffing down? I don't know. Abinadi comes in and dun 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 and just cranks that thing and it pops open for Alma and he's like, "There's sin, there's guilt, there's a gap, but His way will overcome it." Alma begins to plead with King Noah, "Don't be angry with him. Let him depart in peace." And that just makes the king even angrier and wants to expand the death threats beyond Abinadi to Alma as well. So Alma runs, conceals himself, importantly, writes down everything Abinadi had spoken. I'm so grateful for the good memory and the careful recording of this young, repentant Alma. The king's guards then surround and take Abinadi for three days, counsel what they'll do with him, and then say in verse 7, we found an accusation against the which suggests that they had to look hard to find one. But they found it, and thou art worthy of death. Now notice what they say. Eight is interesting. You said that God should come down among the children of men, and for this cause thou shalt be put to death. So you're being condemned for your blasphemy. 
This idea of a condescending Christ, that's blasphemous. Notice the accusation seemed to have nothing to do with these threats of eternal damnation or earthly punishment that he had mentioned back in chapter 12. And yet notice the way out. You can tell that this is all deceptive on their part, all smoke and mirrors, because of what they, that the offer, the plea bargaining that they're able to do or offer him in, at the end of verse 8. For this cause, your blasphemy, thou shalt be put to death, unless thou wilt recall all the words which thou hast spoken, evil concerning me and my people. Do you see the switch right there in the middle of verse 8? Oh, crafty. We're going to condemn you for blasphemy. Because that's, that's impersonal. We're protecting God's image. But we'll let you off for blasphemy if you'll take back the mean things you said about us. There's no connection between the two. What they're really angry about is you're calling us sinners. But that seems a little petty. So let's trump up charges of blasphemy and then make your conditions of survival based on your absolving us of the things that you said against us. Verse 9, Abinadi sees right through it. I'm not going to do it. I won't take your plea bargain. I will not recall the words which I've spoken. They're true. And to prove it, here I am. I will stand as a witness against you at the last day. I've suffered myself to fall into your hands. And I'll suffer unto death. I'll take it to that point to seal my testimony with blood. I'm not going to recall the words. They'll stand as a testimony against you. If you slay me, you've shed innocent blood. One more way that Abinadi will bear witness of the master he serves. And it almost softened Noah's heart. He was about to release him. Almost thou persuadest me, not to be a Christian, but to be scared of the consequences of my own sin. But no. Verse 12, the priests rile up the king and say, no, he's reviled the king. This is based on your honor then. And in order to preserve his so-called honor, the king delivered up Abinadi to be slain. They bound him. They scourged his skin with faggots even unto death. But as the flames were rising, again, that previous sermon from chapter 16, probably echoing in his own ears to give him faith and courage moving forward. He then ends where he began, by prophesying of the consequences of sin. You wouldn't take the Lord's offer of grace to bring you up. And so God's justice will come crashing down on you when his arms of mercy were so fully extended. Verse 19, his final words then, O God, receive my soul. And no doubt he did. And when Abinadi had said these words, he fell, having suffered death by fire, yea, having been put to death because he would not deny the commandments of God, having sealed the truth of his words by his death. Is there a more eloquent testimony? Is there a more powerful sermon? I testify of the truth of what Abinadi has taught them and us today. I'm grateful for this light that can never be darkened, for a life that is endless. I'm grateful for a condescending Christ. I grapple with this gap all the time. My behaviors fall lamentably short of my beliefs all too often. But I would rather deal with that guilt knowing that it is also filled with grace. I would rather come unto Christ. I refuse to push down the -the jack-in-the-box and close the lid. The words of truth just move that crank ceaselessly. I testify of God's goodness, His mercy, His love, His condescension. I know that He knows us having come down to our level. Could there be a better message for those in stage two of this process? That second generation of rejectors, as we shift our attention next week to the third generation, the people of Limhi, this nostalgia for the early days, the grandson remembering what the son had rejected and longing for it, the It'll come full circle. I can't help but think that Abinadi's message had an effect upon the people 
not just on Alma, who was visibly converted that day, but on the people that would join Alma early, and even on the people that remained behind with Limhi, but who ultimately found their way back to Zarahemla. That is the hope for all of us. It is a hope I leave with each of you, with my love and gratitude for a Lord who loves each of us. May our faith in him become truly unshaken as we repent of our sins and come with full purpose of heart. Thank you for spending this time with me in the scriptures. I hope it's been a blessing to you as it has been to me. There's so much more yet to come. So I hope you'll be back again next week. Take care.